Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. Today we will be listening to the 11th part of what if Deku became a vigilante. If you enjoy, please consider liking, commenting, and subscribing down below and don't forget to hit that bell icon so you get notified when videos go live. Now, without further ado, let's get into the video. Chapter 36, Show What You Know. Hitashi was terrified. Here he was, standing in an observation room over ground beta, surrounded by his new classmates. He's had a total of three training exercises that weren't being taught by dumb Asmagi. He's been in his new costume a total of three times, and the first time was just putting it on to make sure everything fit. So when his teacher said something about assessing their progress he started to sweat. This is an assessment to see how far you have come since the beginning of the year, and how far you still have left to go. All Might exclaimed. Use this as a test to see if you're ready for the final exams, Aizawa Sensei said, cocooned in his sleeping bag and leaning against the podium that All Might was standing behind. We will be redoing the pretest you all did at the beginning of the year. Like last time, teams will be randomly pulled through lots, and like last time, someone will need to volunteer to go twice dash dibs. Which will be Young Bakugu. Hitashi was nervous as he pulled his lot, seeing that he was being paired up with Ajuru, and watched as his doom was spelled. Team G, Yurika Okako and Bakugu Katsuki, vs Team J, Ashido Mina and Kauta Kauji. Team F, Shinsu Hitashi and Ajuru Mashirao, vs Team A, Tokoyami Fumikage and Todoroki Shouto. Team I, Hagakure Toru and Yeyorozu Momo, vs Team C, Kiris Hima Ajuru and Satura Kidu. Team H, Ajui Ktsuya vs Itsa Tinya, vs Team B, Jiro Kuka and Siro Hanta. Team D, Kaminari Denki and Shouji Mezu, vs Team E, Aoyama Yuaga and Bakugu Katsuki. Hey. He looked up at Ajuru. Shinsu, right. He nodded, looking back up at the match list. We have the first match to come up with a plan. Alright. So here's what I know. Alright what the actual hell. His teammate wasn't much better, his jaw dropped on the floor as they stared up at the building. Or what used to be a building, because it was more of a glacier now. Hitashi was having war flashbacks to the sports festival. Is it too late to forfeit? We've got to try. Ajuru said. We have to prove that we can overcome a seemingly impossible challenge. I get that, but I also don't want to break my ribs in a training exercise. It's fine, this doesn't change the plan, Ajuru said. Yes it does. I'm not going in there. Hitashi sighed, putting his head in his hands and mentally rearranged the plan. If we capture the villains, we still get the win, right? Yes. Where are you going with this? Todoroki didn't freeze the fire escape, just the entrance in through the fire escape, he pointed out. My quirk doesn't require me to be in the building. If you bring them roughly around there, I can snare them and you can capture them. Do you think they'll figure it out from you very obviously pointing out where we're going to lure them to? That isn't one way ice. If we can't see them, they can't see us. The buzzer went off, startling them both. They very silently nodded, awkwardly stood there, and darted in different directions. Ajuru darted into the door while Hitashi slowly crept up the fire escape. He adjusted the artificial vocal cords, taking a gamble and setting the vocal cords to Tokoyama's voice. Maybe. His best guess at it, anyways. So he waited. And waited. And waited. They had calm pieces, so he could tell that Ajuru was fighting Todoroki, but he knew that they weren't anywhere close to him. Shaking his self-preservation instincts, he reluctantly entered the building, sneaking his way through the winding hallways towards where he could hear Ajuru and Todoroki fighting. Crouching around the corner, he made sure the artificial vocal cords were still set to where he wanted. Todoroki. Are you there? He could only imagine the look of pure confusion on the hero student's face. What are you dash? Hitashi grinned under the mask as he used his quirk. He stepped around the corner to watch his teammate bind Todoroki's wrist, and only then did he release his quirk. I thought you were waiting outside. Ajuru asked, as All Might's voice boomed over the intercom. I was sitting there for two minutes and we're on a time limit. Hitashi walked over to them, where Todoroki had decided to just wait. Where is your teammate? The boy just stared blankly at him. Can you use your quirk on him? Ajuru asked. Not how it works. Sorry, I thought it was worth a shot. Hitashi shrugged, 
turning on his heel and walking besides Ajiru as they went through the hallways. Tokoyama's quirk gets stronger in the darkness, Ajiru said, so presumably he'll be in a room with no windows. That knocks out the top two floors, they all have windows. So we're looking at the first three floors. Floor 3, Ajiru said. I can't hear anything, and dark shadow can get pretty loud. They both sprinted up the stairs, skipping steps as they went, and Hitashi didn't almost slip and fall on his face, that didn't happen, which meant that Hitashi was slightly winded by the end. But on the bright side, both of them could pretty clearly hear dark shadow roaring. Hitashi adjusted his vocal cords to match Todoroki's voice as close as he could get while he followed Ajiru. Crouching outside the doorway to the room with the bomb, Hitashi spoke. Are you alright, Tokoyami? Surprisingly, he got a response from Dark Shadow, and kind of a response from Tokoyami. We're good. Dark Shadow, no dash. Carpeying that DM, Hitashi reached out with his quirk. Ajiro took the opportunity to sprint to the bomb and touch it. The hero team wins. With a sigh, he released the quirk. Now that the adrenaline rush was starting to fade, he realized he was shivering. Can someone please tell the Ice Prince that not everything needs to be an Elsa castle? Hitashi snarked, then realized that he's been spending way too much time around Midoriya because he's the only one who would get that reference. How are you cold? You're wearing about the same thing I am, Ajiro said, completely ignoring the fact that his costume was fucking fur-lined. My costume is optimized for stealth, not freezing buildings. As the three of them were slowly walking out of the room, Tokoyami, who he was just fighting against, yes fighting is a bit of a stretch but he was being dramatic, sue him, pulled off his cloak, revealing that he was wearing short sleeves underneath it. He tossed it to Hitashi, who gratefully wrapped it around his shoulders. Thanks, but what about Dash? Oh, yeah I guess that works. Dark Shadow had immediately wrapped around Tokoyama's arms and shoulders like a weirdly shaped jacket. We should probably pick up Todoroki, Ajiro said. I think he's still standing where we left him. How is he not cold either? He can use the fire side of his quirk to keep himself warm without actually creating a flame. Hitashi grumbled, pulling the cloak tighter around him. Lucky bastard. Katsuki can handle a lot of shit in life. People think he can't, because he starts yelling whenever something goes wrong, but they're wrong. Yelling is how he handles that shit, because if nothing else at least he can shout about it and it will make him feel marginally better. The point is, he can handle a lot, but being backstabbed by his teammate was the last fucking straw. They were against Dunceface and the Octopus Extra as the villain team, Katsuki learned from last time and made sure the room was completely dry. There wasn't any use in hiding the bomb because the Octopus Extra would know where they were, so they decided to be on the roof and just focus on defending the bomb instead of taking the risk that one of them would slip by. Ideally it was a stalling match, which he and Twinkle Toes could easily win. When Twinkle Toes said that he was going to scout out the top floor, Katsuki believed him. Instead, the traitor went to the heroes and let himself be captured, ratting out where the bomb was. Which the other team probably knew where it was, neither of them were exactly quiet, but it was the principle of the matter that pissed him off. Twinkle Toes spouted some bullshit to the teachers about how realistically, if he was on the side of villains he would do the heroic thing and turn himself in, but he could tell that Hobo Sensei didn't buy a single word of that. So here he was, trailing Twinkle Toes on the campus after school's just been let out. Despite what people think, he can be sneaky sometimes. He paused, standing next to the fountain and scanning the area around him before pulling up his phone. Unfortunately, the noise of the fountain means Katsuki can't hear the call, but the fact is that Twinkle Toes purposely sabotaged his performance and is calling someone on school grounds. Kikin. There you are. He was pulled into a tackle hug from behind by his green idiot. We were looking for you, and the Baku squad said they didn't know where you went. That's what the idiots are calling themselves now. Katsuki said, but it fell a little flat as he and Twinkle Toes made eye contact. He glared at Twinkle Toes while he hurriedly put his phone away, and only when the bastard was out of sight did he let himself be dragged off by Zuku. I'm onto you, Trade Ortos. Chapter 37, Intervention Tuya stood in front of his board, continuing to pin pieces of paper up onto it. Manamai had her laptop open, helping him put stuff on the cork board, while Himiko egged them both on. Danjiro himself was making tea in the kitchenette, ignoring what was going on behind him for a few blissful moments. 
but the little bubble of peace he had managed to cultivate had to burst eventually, and he grabbed the cups of tea he made, as well as a donut box that Tuya probably stole, bringing it over to the others. And who would be at a high enough position to make sweeping changes in the favor of the League of Villains? Tuya asked dramatically, pointing to a small photo on the board. The Vice President of the Hero Public Safety Commission. What's the crazy conspiracy now? Danjiro asked, sitting down on his stool. Uh, Himiko squinted at the board. The Ministry of Education works for the MLA and the Vice President of the HPSC works for the League of Villains. I think. It's not crazy. He started desperately pointing at strings connecting the portraits and newspaper clippings. Follow the money. Right, Danjiro deadpanned, taking a sip of his tea. And how is this helping Midoriya at all? While the meeting did give Tuya an excuse to pull out his conspiracy board again, the real purpose was to figure out a way to help Midoriya. They had all noticed that their fox was withdrawing from them, and it was about time for an intervention. Or as close to an intervention as possible when it was being arranged by four vigilantes. I'm just saying that the quickest way to remove the villain ranking is to kill the vice president. He sighed, setting his mug down. We'll keep that as a last resort. Any other suggestions? Preferably without murder. Himiko had excitedly raised her hand, but slowly lowered it when he rejected murder ideas. Well, the two groups that Foxy was always keeping an eye on were the League of Villains and the Shihasakai, Aba pointed out. Maybe if we take out one of those groups, he can relax a little. It's like he's running from both of them, Tuya muttered. Danjiro cut him off before he could go into another conspiracy theory spiel. We're all running from something, Tuya. There was a moment of silence, before Himiko spoke up. Stop making me think about depressing shit. Back to the plan. So we're either dealing with a villain group with massive pull and influence, or a Yakuza group, Aba said. Our odds are fantastic. Well, the Yakuza have been waning, Tuya pointed out. Our odds are better tackling the Shihasakai. Still not great, Aba muttered under her breath, furiously typing on her laptop. They've been dipping into trigger dealing as a way to fund their experiments into quirk cancelling drugs. Plus apparently the boss, Overhaul, has been slowly turning the group into a cult, so there's that. Trigger happy Yakuza cultists was not on my bingo card, Himiko said, taking a massive bite of her donut. If Overhaul has been turning the group into a cult though, there's bound to be a divide between those loyal to Overhaul and the Shihasakai as a whole, Danjiro pointed out. We can use that to our advantage. Everyone looked over at Tuya. I'd like to put killing the vice president back on the table. Come on Tuya. You can do it. Tuya. I'm just saying that I'm only a broker, he put his hands up. I can't pull off a stunt like making the Shihasakai implode. No that's fair, Danjiro said. If we're going to bring down the Shihasakai, we need to do so together. We can't try and do this alone, that's the exact mistake that Midoriya made. There was a long moment of silence, as everyone processed what he just said. Tuya reached up and kicked his conspiracy theory corkboard. It spun wildly, landing on the empty side. Aba, give me the deeds. The what? Tuya slapped a sticky note onto the board labeled Yakuza cultists. If we're gonna go in on destroying the Yakuza cult we need a new board. This is kind of sad. They were all staring at the board with the addition of five scraps of paper. And one of those scraps just said Kitsune. No, Tuya's onto something, Aba said. We just don't have enough information yet. So we have to get more information. Danjiro said. Do we have locations that we can scout out? Oh, I do. Himiko raised her hand. There's a warehouse on the docks where they distribute trigger from. Huh. Which warehouse? How do you know this? A couple warehouses over from where the guys set a bunch of Sternapro on fire. A guy I killed a couple days ago told me before I killed him. I'm glad you clarified otherwise I would have thought you were a necromancer, Tuya snarked, slapping another piece of paper on the board. Do you think the Sternapro guy was related to the Shihasakai Dash? I am gonna cut you off there, Aba said. We can't just bust in there, that'll attract too much attention Dash. Heist plan. Himiko shouted pulling out a binder from who knows where and slamming it down. She was practically vibrating with excitement. Danjiro sighed. I knew that letting you introduce her to Leverage was a bad idea. The fuck is Leverage? Tuya asked. Is it Dash? 
it's not related to the Shihasakai. Eva looked over Himiko's shoulder. How many heist plans have you come up with? This is only binder number 5. Number 5? We just started watching a week ago. Your plan to break into Endeavor's agency has some flaws. Can we please get back on track? Himiko opened up to a section with a little bookmark labeled Recon. I've got different plans depending on what we got. Obviously we don't have Foxy, but do we have a drone? Eva looked over at her. Excuse me? Do I have a drone? Who do you think I am? Of course I do. Great. Here's the plan then. Tuya you can't avoid our movie nights forever. Look, some of us have things to do put the gun down. I'll come, I'll come. Great, make sure you bring snacks. We're watching Ocean's Eleven. Nerds. Conspiracy Nut. Chapter 38, Scars of Overhaul. Eri sat at the table, munching on a carrot as she sat with Xiao Chan. She was with Aizunayaken at Yeomomo's house again, they were all studying for some sort of test, so she was working on her schoolwork too. They were all taking a break, since they'd been studying for a while. Eri had finished her math worksheet, so she was just doodling on the back. She'd finished drawing Aizunayaken, Yeomomo, Yurikan, and Kikan, and now she was looking at Xiao Chan to draw him. Midoriya Chan, are you alright? Hmm. Eri blinked. Oh, I'm alright. I'm trying to draw you. Xiao Chan leaned over to observe her artwork while she held her pencil up to his face like she'd seen Aizunaya can do. You're pretty good, Xiao Chan said, his hand hovering awkwardly above her head. She leaned up to press the top of her head to his hand like she'd seen Missy do. Xiao Chan gave her a few pats on the head, and she smiled as it felt like a nice warm hat was being set on her head. Making an executive decision, she crawled onto Xiao Chan's lap, sitting on his warm side. You're comfy. Thank you. Eri looked up. Can I borrow your hand? Sure. She pulled his arm over her shoulder, gently pressing his palm to the inside of her arms. She sighed, as the pain from her scars slowly ebbed away. Remembering her manners, she said, Thank you Xiao Chan. You're welcome. They sat there for a few moments, with Eri just enjoying the warmth. Xiao Chan broke the silence to ask, Are you okay? Hmm. The heat is nice. No more hurry. Why were you hurting? Scars. Scars. She held out her arm, rolling the sleeve down a little bit to show the scars off. They're from before I lived with Aizunaya Khan. Please don't ask. I won't, promise. She reached up, booping Xiao Chan on the nose. Can I stay here? Yeah, you can. Izuku came back from the bathroom, a small smile on his face when he saw that Eri was sleeping in Shouto's lap. She was snoozing on the side of Shouto that gave off heat, and Shouto was holding her like she was the most precious person in the world. Thank you, he mouthed to the other boy. Of course. Shouto responded back. Project confidence. Act like you're supposed to be there. Know the lingo. Dabby because he's Dabby while he's working, healthy work slash life balance and all cracked his neck, turning the tracker on and slipping it into his pocket. The tracker is so that La Brava is aware of where he is, so that she can send gentle if he gets into some deep shit. He knows that they're using one of Himichan's heist plans, but all he remembers is that he's on distraction duty. And if he can fish for info, that will also help. Hello. Dabby called out, spinning around in the warehouse. Anyone home? He stood in place as he felt a knife to his throat. A man with dark green hair covered by a stupid fedora stalked his way in front of his line of sight, with a couple of goons following behind. The knife at Dabby's neck was clearly the man's quirk, since he was telepathically floating another one in his hands. And who the fuck are you? Name's Dabby. He kept his hands in his pockets, trying to look as nonplussed as possible. Word is that certain drugs are being sold here. Fedora man squinted his eyes. You aren't one of them shape-shifting narcs, are you? Of course they recognize his name, but he hadn't heard anything about cops with shape-shifting quirks. He made a mental note to look into that and said, come on. No pig can get my handsome mug this accurate. They would have fucked up the staple placement. Fedora man gestured with his hand, and Dabby let out a sigh of relief as the knife floated away from his jugular. Do you treat all your prospective business partners like this or am I special? We treat all intruders like threats. The man rolled his eyes, flicking his wrist and making all the knives disappear. 
Not that this floor is bad, but do you have an office we can discuss in? My back bitches at me if I stand for too long. The man's eye twitched. Dabby was clearly on his nerves. Back to your posts, he addressed the goons, waving his hand as he started walking off. Dabby jogged to catch up. So what's your name? I can't just keep calling you Fedora Man in my head. Fedora Man glared at him. Doku. Oh, what kind of venom is on those knives? Shut up. Yeah, that's fair. The security guards are moving back to their posts, are you in? Yeah, I'm in the vents. Himi-chan's voice crackled through the earbud. Despite how she was whispering, it came in clear as day to La Brava. She and Gentle Criminal are standing on the rooftop of a warehouse, a couple buildings over from the one they were breaking into. Well, Gentle was standing and keeping watch, while La Brava herself was sitting down with two laptops. One had the camera feet of the drone following Dabby and Slash or Himi-chan from the rafters of the warehouse, while the other had the map with both of the trackers on it. All right, you're making your way to the office wing at the back of the building, La Brava said, moving the drone to keep a tab on the locations of the guards. Focus on going right. You're right or mine. It's the same right? Oh, and don't drop down into any room, I've got to make sure you don't drop into the same office that Dabby's in. Yeah, yeah, I got it. Also, can you make sure you throw in some fun quips? I need to make sure we have footage to work with for the video dash. You're turning this into a video. Duh. How do you think this all gets funded? The heists. No. It's the YouTube ad money. Or it's more like the merch company, most of our videos get demonetized. Oh, can I have merch of myself? Sure, we can get you a mug or a sweater or something. Dabby's tracking spot stopped in one of the offices, and La Brava used the drone to scout out the filing room. All right, now turn to the left, take the next right turn, nope your other right, all right three vent covers in, yes that one. That's your room. She heard a soft thump as Himi-chan landed. Oh, they label their drawers, that's helpful. Stop making fun of my organization system and start searching. Aye aye, Captain. Himi-chan started rifling through the cabinets. La Brava used the drone to look over her shoulder, because while she has the GoPro strapped to Himi-chan's forehead, she likes having multiple angles to work with, and saw that she was currently looking through the drawers labeled shipping logs. These should work. She held up four stuffed manila envelopes for the drone to see, then placed them on top of the drone while she pulled out four identical manila envelopes from her bag. She slipped the dupe envelopes, filled with blank printer paper, right where they pulled out the intel, and shut the drawer again. When she reached out to grab the folders from off the drone, La Brava snickered to herself as she moved the drone just out of Himi-chan's reach. She made a great face, that was definitely gonna go on the thumbnail, as she managed to jump and grab the folders, sticking them in her bag. All right, you remember the way out. Absolutely not, I'll just wing it do you mind if I use the drone as a jump point dash. Absolutely not Himiko. And that's how Himiko was sitting in the corner of the room, wearing a sweater that said time out and a dunce cap. Tuya still hasn't stopped laughing. All right, that's where we'll leave off for the day. Thanks so much for listening along with me today. Once there are enough chapters uploaded to release another episode of the series I will, but in the meantime, the next video will start a new series. If you enjoyed please like and comment down below. It really helps with the algorithms. I look forward to seeing you next time. Ciao for now, lovelies.